Uh, I'm C. Brown. I'm the uh, extension entomologist for field crops uh, for the state of Louisiana with the LSU Ag Center. And I'm stationed at the Dean Lee Research Station, but I work the entire state from the Gulf of Mexico to Arkansas. So, um, like I said, if you guys ever have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact me and I'm be happy to help you. Uh, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about row rice and some of the issues that we see with insects and row rice. Uh, bill bugs are an emerging issue that we've gotten questions on over the past couple years um, you know we've really seen an uptick in the amount of fields that experience bill bugs and row rice uh, are my colleagues to the north in Arkansas have seen it a little bit longer than we have and so in Louisiana uh, we've got some trials established specifically the one I'm standing in front of or the one behind me uh, that's actually a seed treatment trial that we're looking at to see what seed treatments currently available can potentially control bill bugs and row rice and so so why bill bugs become an issue in row rice is because we don't hold water on the field. So typically in paddy rice, where it has a permanent flood, bill bugs are not aquatic. So they can't live in the water like our rice water weevil larva can. So bill bug adults, bill bug larva are not considered aquatic. And so when you've got paddy rice that's under permanent flood, they actually, if you do have bill bugs, they drown. Well, with row rice, since we don't water or we, the, the rice doesn't stand under a permanent flood, you'll actually get bill bug adults will emerge in, the, in April and May and fly into a, a, a field that's been you know freshly planted or has a little bit of growth on it and they'll actually lay an egg. They lay one egg singly at the base of a plant and then over time as that egg hatches that larva will chew on the inner the, uh, the inner components of rice, they'll chew on the tillers and so what are in the, in the crown and what will happen is they'll actually pupate at the base of the rice and so as your rice matures and starts to push ahead out the injury is actually a whitehead and so it's very similar similar to what we see with uh, stem borers, especially in South Louisiana. The symptomology is very similar. It's what we call a whitehead, and they're really easy to see in a rice field. And so, um, you know, what we're looking at at the Ag Center is we're trying to figure out if a seed treatment, and we're trying to discover if a seed treatment is going to be the best option for us to control these. Because uh, unfortunately, we don't know a whole lot about their biology. They're a fairly new insect for us, even for Arkansas and Louisiana. Uh, we don't really know what attracts them to rice yet. We do think they come out out of tree lines and they overwinter under detritus and things on around rice fields and so uh, we're not really sure exactly where they're coming from but like I said we have an idea and so and we know that we really can't control them with a foliar application so our best treatment is going to be a seed treatment so that's what we're examining here behind me is looking to see what best seed treatment is going to work uh, for control of rice billbug and um, you know, also stink bugs have been kind of an issue that I've gotten some calls on this year as well in row rice. Uh, we've been having some issues with control with pyrethroids for uh, rice stink bug. Um, you know, an option if a pyrethroid's not working is to use a product called Tenchu. It's a different mode of action. It's a neonicotinoid. And so uh, it's going to be a different mode of action and it works very well on rice stink bug, but it's also much more expensive. So uh, we are seeing some issues uh, controlling rice stink bug with pyrethroids and uh, if you guys have any problems with that, please feel free to call me. Uh, I'd be happy to, to help you walk you through that situation or come make a collection or answer questions if that rice stink bug is really giving you, causing you a lot of concern and issues. Um, <clears throat> kind of going quickly over this, what I'm seeing in soybeans this year, uh, everything is, seems to be early in soybeans. So stink bugs were early, worms are, are early, everything is early this year. Uh, red banded stink bugs did not overwinter well at all in South Louisiana. We were seeing Seeing, or they overwintered, excuse me, let me rephrase that. They overwintered well in South Louisiana. Not good for farmers. Uh, and Jan we were picking them up in January. So I plant crimson clover around a lot of my fields just so for something for them to feed on. And it was loaded the first week of January with red banded. So they were here. They've been here. We sent a very large population into overwintering last year. They're, they're in the clover. They're reproducing or they were in the spring. And then they're starting to migrate into fields. Uh, the native stink bugs, the, the browns, the greens, and southern greens, 
Marines. I'm starting to hear about some pretty large populations of those, uh, especially in South Louisiana, working its way into North Louisiana. So you guys, I know if, you're, if your beans are reaching R5 to R6, you're definitely gonna start seeing an influx of stink bugs. And then worms as well. So soybean loopers are starting to show up in South and North Louisiana. Uh, it's about a month early for us on those. And same thing with green clover worm and velvet bean caterpillars are showing up about a month earlier than we normally see them. So uh, 2020 has really kind of, I think the lack of winter and just the year that 2020 has been has really sped everything up. So uh, it's been a very interesting insect year in all aspects uh, in all the crops that I look at. So uh, like I said, I'm uh, C. Brown. I'm extension entomologist with the LSU Ag Center. If you guys ever have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to help you. Thanks.